This is All India Radio. Power of Listening. Under the series tonight, we take you on a journey to the world of yet another magnificent facet of traditional Indian knowledge systems. In today's episode, we shall be focusing on ancient India's cultural contribution to Asia. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Power of Listening, a joint initiative of Doordarshan and All India Radio that brings out how India enriched and empowered the world through its traditional knowledge. Our guest today is Dr. Shashi Bala. She is a renowned endologist who specializes in India's cultural contribution to several Asian countries. Today we will ask her about how valuable the contribution of several Indian scholars was in building the cultural foundations of many Asian countries. Welcome Dr. Bala. Namaskar. Available research tells us about how traditional Indian knowledge and Buddhist teachings traveled to China and went further into the whole of East Asia. Tell us about the start of this tradition. Actually, India is a distinct land. It has a distinct culture, which was not available. The Indian knowledge systems, all the texts, the philosophy, the huge literature, Whatever was there in India was not available in any other country. So there was a lot of enthusiasm in all the countries around India, including China. So when did Chinese came to know about India is, is a question. It starts from the third century BC, when Chinese came to know about India and its culture, about Buddhism, about the knowledge that we had. And there is a history about an emperor, a Chinese emperor, who sent a mission and who sent Chang Chien, a general, in 138 BC to India. It's very interesting to know about the voyages of Chang Chien and what he carried from here. He talked about trade also and he reported after going back in 138 BC that uh, the products of uh, Sichuan and uh, Yunnan, that side of China, were sold in the markets of Bactria. And Indians were doing it. And he is the person who took the Indian musical instrument all, and the melodies from India to China. And those melodies are very important for us to know because it, the name of the melody is Mahatukhar. And Tukharian melody is very rarely found now in India. And then we have to talk about the contribution of the Emperor Kanishka, who played a major role in establishing cultural relations with China. And uh, we must know about him that he is the only emperor of India who received a Chinese title and the title is Son of Heaven. If we talk about uh, the inscriptional evidence, the first inscription is dated 67 AD. That is discovered from the White House Monastery in China when they talk about two Sanskrit masters who reached China with Sanskrit texts carried on white horses. But they did not go from India actually, they had gone from UHE area. UHE, Sogdians, Parthians, they were all contributed to spread Buddhism in China. The so first you... translator of Buddhist texts into Chinese is a Parthian prince, An Shikau. And the relations with China, when they started with Kanishka, Kanishka had a war with the Chinese and he brought some princes and captured them and brought them to India. And they were brought to the modern Punjab and the area was called Chinabukti and now it is called Chinyari. Chinyari is near the modern city Firozpur in the state of Punjab. And when we talk of uh, uh, intercultural relations, then the question comes to mind that we must have taken something from China also. So these princes who were brought by Kanishka as captives, they introduced two fruits. One is peach and one is 
peer. So that's about the cross-cultural exchanges uh, between yeah. India and China. That's interesting. But tell us about the geography of the region then, the kind of kingdoms that were there. You've told us about several emperors. Which kingdoms in Asia were interested in learning about uh, traditional Indian knowledge systems? When we talk of uh, Asia as a whole, then you can say all the Asian countries were eager and they took a lot from India. For example, when we start talking about Southeast Asia, there was no script in Southeast Asia. They developed all the South Asian scripts on the basis of Indian scripts. Whoever the Acharyas, who were the traders who were going to these countries and whatever they were carrying, that was accepted by them and they developed their different scripts. So I have been talking about these scripts as they de were developed in Indonesia or Myanmar or uh, uh, Sri Lanka or Laos or Thailand or Cambodia in all the countries. And when we talk about the beginning of our relations, then we have to talk about Sage Kaundinya, who was the first to go to Cambodia from India and he married the princess there and established a kingdom. Sage Agastya, he went to Indonesia. So there was a continuous flow of people and culture. Traders were the first who carried Indian culture there although there is no historical evidence about it. But when we look at the inscriptional evidence discovered from Southeast Asia, they start from second century AD. And when you move on, then the highest number, the largest number of Sanskrit inscriptions that are discovered from Southeast Asia are from Cambodia. More than 1200 Sanskrit inscriptions. They carried the philosophy, they carried religion, they carried uh, not only the Buddhist pantheon, but also Shaiv and Vaishnava pantheon. They took Ramayana and Mahabharata with them, they carried Manusmriti with them. It's mentioned in the inscriptions discovered from Cambodia that they used to um, call Indian uh, pandits and uh, they used to carry the Puranas the Manusmriti, the Panini's grammar. So anybody who was well-versed in Panini was highly esteemed. So wherever you go to Southeast Asia, wherever you go to, if you go to Japan, if you go to Korea, if you go to the Mongolia, if you go to Tibet, wherever you go all around India, you find that we start our connections uh, sometime in first century AD. I'm talking about on the basis of the historical evidence. For example, the a Korean prince married a princess from Ayodhya in first century AD. When we talk of Japan, Japan received first Buddhism from China via Korea. And the first historical evidence is found from sixth century. But most important point here to be noted is that Saraswati is called Benzaiten and it became a part of a Japanese group of deities that is called Seven Lucky Gods. It's called Shichifukuji in, in Japanese. So she is there. Mahakala is there. That means that Japanese knew about India before official introduction of this. So it's, it's a long story of more than 2000 years that we have to discuss when we talk about India's cultural contribution and its connections with all the Asian countries. So who were some of those uh, Chinese emperors particularly who came to know about the vast knowledge that Indian scholars and monks had about Buddhist teachings and reached out to them? The earliest Chinese emperors who came to know about is around 3rd century BC. But according to written records in 1st century AD, there was an emperor Ming Ti who had a dream that some kind of an effulgence, some light has entered his palace. Then when he gets up in the morning, he talks to his astrologers. Astrology was a developed science in China already also, although they had many new things after uh, dissemination of war, when Buddhism reached there and the text reached there. But when he asked his astrologers in the morning that what does it mean? Then they told him that this light is the light of Buddhism and now we have to bring Buddhism from India. Then he sends 
as an envoy to India to bring back Buddhist masters. And they returned with the masters whose names are given in an inscription, Kashyap, Matang, and Dharmraksh. It's, it's a beautiful detail that is given there, that how they reached there and how they were welcomed by the emperor and uh, how a new monastery was built for them so that they could work, they could translate the text. Translation of text is the most important. It's key to our relations with China. Whatever our knowledge systems reached China, it was through a translation of our text. And all these texts were not just translated once. They were translated many times because many emperors, they found, oh, this may not be a good translation. Maybe we can do a better translation. And whenever they had problems, anything, there were conflicts, there were wars, there were famine, there were epidemics. So they always used to invite Buddhist masters from India. And there are some very interesting stories about them. For example, there is a story about, uh, because, because of the pandemic these days, I want to talk about it, that uh, when a Buddhist master reached uh, China, he took some wall kind of a uh, thing, but uh, nobody has uh, written about it, what was that. He presented to, it to the emperor. Emperor was not much impressed, but anyway, it was a gift from India. He accepted it, kept it. After some time, there was an epidemic in China. And then the teacher said to fumigate it, to burn it. And after the fumigation, it is, I'm talking about whatever has been written in the Chinese historical chronicles. So when uh, this ball-like thing uh, was burned and with the fumigation, they could control the pandemic for three months in an area of 50 kilometers. There are other emperors also who uh, were so keen to get uh, masters from uh, whenever they came to know about any famous Buddhist master, then um, they were so keen to um, have a, in his kingdom, in his um, empire. So for I just want to give you one example for this. For example, when Kumaraji was fame reached China, he was a son of a princess of Pucha. His father was a Kashmiri Brahman. He was from a very rich, high-profile family. His name was Kumarayana, but he wanted to work for Buddhism and he took monk's robes and he began to travel uh, towards China. And whosoever was traveling from India to China via the Silk Road, there were many small kingdoms there. So one of the kingdoms where he reached was Kucha. And the prince of Kucha stopped him forcefully and he forced him to leave the monk's robes because they were trying to find an appropriate match for the princess because she was so such a devout Buddhist and she had so much of knowledge about Buddhism. So he could have been the best match for him. So he had to leave his monk's robes, forcefully had to marry. Then their son was called Kumara Jiva. So Kumara Jiva, half of his name is taken from his father and Jiva was his mother's name. So Kumara Jiva. Can you believe that an army of 70,000 soldiers were sent because he sent requests to the king of Kucha to give him Kumara Jiva, but he did not want to do that. Finally, he sent an army of 70,000 soldiers to capture him. When he reached China, on his way because that time people were traveling by horses and it used to take a lot of time. In the meantime, there was some turmoil, political uh, turmoil in China and uh, power shifted from one emperor to another. And people did not understand why they have captured the soldiers, did not understand, their generals did not understand why they are bringing Kumara Jiva and who is he? And they could not uh, understand the knowledge that he had. So they put him in jail. So when he was in prison for 17 years, then he learned Chinese. Whatever the kingdoms were there on the Silk Route, people were not knowing Chinese language. People knew more of Sanskrit. There are many such evidences. There was no Chinese culture beyond the Great Wall of China. 
Hmm, absolutely. These are interesting important. facts that you are bringing out. Uh, but this journey that uh, scholars uh, had to make from India to China and further to several other East Asian regions would have been quite perilous, isn't it? Tell us about oh, the kind of difficulties that they faced in their journey. It was full of dangers. It was full of difficulties. People who were traveling by the Silk Route, they could not get a drop of water or any food for days. Many of them fainted. Many of them died. Even people going from India to China or coming from China to India, they had a lot of problems because of scarcity of water and food, number one. Number two was horses. Sometimes their horses used to die. Number three was robbers because they used to carry gold or something to maintain themselves because after all, they were traveling abroad. Robbers knew about it. So they never took a road. There was no proper road for them to travel. It was called Silk Route because to avoid robbers, they were taking different routes. And then food was such a big problem. I don't know what kind of food the Indians were eating because it, it must have been so much, so much difficult for them to eat the Chinese food. Going, for example, to Tibet, Going to such a high altitude was another problem. For example, there was one Acharya, Atisha, who went to Tibet and he knew that he was short in his life because of the high altitude, because of the food, his health will deteriorate. But still he went there. So traveling by sea was equally difficult because the voyages by sea were not easy. They had to wait for months for the... Uh, favorable winds. They used to stay on their way, for example, Java, Sumatra, and there are many other places where the Chinese and the Indians used to stay while they were going to China or coming to India. Java was a great center of learning for Sanskrit. It Singh, when he came, then he stayed in Java for learning Sanskrit grammar for six months there. And he could easily find Chinese food. He could easily find Chinese ink and paper to write. These are also the things that you need. When I was traveling on the Silk Route, we were traveling by air-conditioned cars, staying in hotels. But still, every day after traveling, when we used to reach a hotel way, oh, it was very tiring. I used to be very emotional about all the Acharyas. What kind of difficulties did they have? When you have no, no shade, no place to uh, take rest, there were halting places only on very distant uh, places. Uh, the monasteries were built where they could work, they were, could stay on their way. For example, Khotan was a great center of Sanskrit learning. Chinese used to send missions to Khotan to bring Sanskrit texts. Khotan was famous for two things. One was Sanskrit texts. Because the Indian teachers who were carrying the text, they used to go to Khatan for also being a huge center of Buddhism. And Chinese also used to come there and they could sit together and translate the text. Translation of text was a very tough task because the Indians, they were not well versed in Chinese. And the Chinese, they knew Sanskrit, but not to that extent that they could translate the philosophical text. Translating a philosophical text from Sanskrit to Chinese is, I think, the toughest task. Initially, when the scholars started translating these texts, then they were doing verbatim translations, word to word, word to word. It was not easy to find parallel words for Sanskrit terms in Chinese. They coined a number of new terms for it. That helped China to enrich its language. When we talk about Buddhism, what it gave to China, there are so many contributions. Because of Buddhism, thousands of monks used to come when the translations were going on. From all over China, they used to gather there. Discussions used to go on. Emperors and princes used to sit themselves to finally take decisions that, yes, this should be the translation of this idea or this uh, text. Emperors yeah. used to write four words for it. So you've told us about the kind of self-sacrifice earlier that Indian monks and uh, scholars made in this process of enriching the world uh, with uh, Buddhist teachings, empowering them in a sense, giving them cultural direction. 
and you also told us about the kind of value that these chinese emperors attached uh, to the kind of knowledge that uh, indian monks had did they also honor the indian scholars and monks with prestigious positions and was kumara jiva one of them yeah there were not only one kumara jiva there are many other masters who were appointed as rajgurus indian masters they influenced the emperor so much that they were given permission to stay inside the palace emperors wanted to stay with them so that they could discuss with them different aspects of buddhist philosophy because it was something new for them and they were so mesmerized by it that buddha what did he have just a begging ball and a walking stick and so much of knowledge that they had the philosophy that they gave was absolutely new for them they did not know about the concepts like ahimsa they did not know how to have compassion towards the masses they did not know how to have the concept of equality according to buddhism all this everybody whosoever is born as a human being is born with it is called buddhankur in sanskrit that you have a spark of knowledge you have a spark of bodhi inside you right so, people liked it so much when there were wars people were in so much of misery then you can think how the philosophy of compassion how the philosophy of loving kindness would have touched their hearts and minds one of them the sutras that is vimal kirti it's very interesting to talk about the sutra vimal kirti nirdesha it's a story about a prince who was very rich but he was a devout buddhist also so his life was full of sacrifice full of love for others once he was very sick buddha sent us many disciples to go and uh, find out how is he feeling everybody was so scared he is such a a fulgent personality they did not dare to go and check they didn't dare to go to see him to visit his palace then finally they all got together and reached his palace when they reached there there was no food there were no chairs to sit no huge seats no there was no nothing to welcome them then they were slightly upset what to do then uh, vimal kirti said i did not know that you are hungry for uh, this kind of food then with his magical powers the, he brought so much of food then it was flowing inside the palace and they said no no we don't need this and they said we don't i'm oh, sorry we where do we where do we sit he said oh you need seats so he magically he brought, brought so many huge seats that they could not even sit on those chairs and his persona was so impressive for the chinese that many of the chinese they accepted the philosophy they internalized the philosophy the life of vimal kirti because chinese did not like the idea of sanyasa they wanted to live with all the luxury in these palaces but be a devout buddhist so the character of vimal kirti suited them the most that is why vimal kirti is so famous all over east asia if you go to china go to tunhuang wherever you go you can see the beautiful panels painted panels murals etc of uh, that depicts the life of vimal kirti and the philosophy Absolutely. it created like a cult there so those are the very respectable indian monks and scholars you've named a few of them there is also a common perception in the world that martial arts and acupuncture have actually come from china yeah. to the rest of the world including india but the reality is different these yeah. are traditional knowledge systems that moved out of india to various countries when you dig deep what do you find there you see it's historically proven it's historically written by the chinese themselves that it was bodhi dharma bodhi dharma was a prince of kanchipuram kanchi was a cradle of learning i'm not going into the details of kanchi and what kind of connections were there from kanchi to canton how people were traveling how people were carrying the knowledge from kanchi to canton and uh, other places this bodhi dharma the prince he became a monk now uh, he studied in nalanda and then he left for china when he reached there 
he is the scholar he is the master who carried the martial arts the indian martial arts is called kalari peyatu in india it's faded because it is a, a knowledge that can be given through guru shishya tradition so that nobody can misuse it so in north india normally we do not practice kalari now i have launched courses for it so that people know about indian martial arts so he was also an expert of marma therapy marma therapy is also an indian knowledge that was taken to china by bodhi dharma and they are, they developed in their own way and it is called uh, acupressure and acupuncture bodhi dharma carried the knowledge of dhyana dhyana yoga yoga is ashtanga yoga if you know about patanjali so yam niyam asan pranayam and then comes the dharana dhyan and samadhi are the later three stages so they carried bodhi dharma carried the philosophy of dhyana yoga which is called chan in chinese it is called song in korea and it is called zen in japan they have developed in their own way also zen has been developed in a different way but the philosophy is the same the scriptures the basic scriptures are the same in japan even today people know about bodhi dharma if you have any wish and you want to go to a monastery or a temple for fulfillment of some wish what they do outside the monasteries you can find dolls that it called daruma dolls they do, they are limbless dolls because when bodhi dharma sat for uh, dhyana in china for years and years he lost his he lost the power he lost uh, his limbs so when you go the first time to a temple to offer the daruma doll they paint just one eye and offer it in the temple when a wish is fulfilled then they go again and then paint the second eye so bodhi dharma is connected to the shaolin monastery if you go to the history of shaolin monastery how the uh, uh, chan philosophy is such a prominent school in china so there is a lot to be studied that and there are a number of proofs that this is indian knowledge system that was carried from by bodhi dharma to china also ayurveda there are proofs about it that how indian vaidyas used to go there because chinese emperors they were so crazy about long life and they knew that the indian vaidyas has some kind of herbs they used to prepare some uh, you can say kadha in sanskrit it is called kadha they used to boil the different kinds of uh, herbs and prepare uh, different kinds of medicines according to the chinese history there was a vaidya uh, who used to give medicine with which one could live for 200 years they have even preserved the prescriptions of those vaidyas we don't have those um, that old prescriptions in india of the vaidyas so they took a lot from india in terms of yoga in terms of ayurveda in terms of astrology metallurgy and all kinds of sacred and secular science did some of the indian monks also possess uh, some extraordinary knowledge with regard to mantras that could achieve feats which are unimaginable reviving dead trees invoking rain amid drought yes because our masters who went there they proved it they were so the the personalities were so mesmerizing for the chinese they could chant the whole text they learned it by heart because in india we have we still have this tradition i was talking to a vaidya he is an expert of uh, siddha ayurved and also marma chikitsa and also kalari kalari paitu so he told me that yes it is written in the text that we can heal we can uh, treat a sick person in three different ways one is by touching one is by chanting mantras and the third is by giving some medicines so these mantras are really effective still people these days even these days you will see people are doing reiki and uh, there are different ways they have developed in their way but in china the most important if we talk about the acharyas who took this 
science of mantras that is called mantrayana. In Buddhism, this is Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, and there is another that is called Mantrayana. Mantrayana means that when the all these East Asian countries, they accepted this knowledge of mantras. First of them, it, the name comes of Shubhakar Singh. Shubhakar Singh again was a professor like in Nalanda University, and he traveled to China first, and he is the first who carried the knowledge of mantras there. It is amazing that the mantras written by Shubhakar Singh are still available. Even I have a scroll with the signatures of Shubhakar Singh. This is the only scroll that is found with the signatures of an Indian master. And from there, this mantrayana traveled to Korea and to Japan. And in Japan, it was developed after the early 9th century. In 805, it was uh, monks came from Japan to study in China and they studied mantrayana. And it was the first time that Kobodaishi took the mantrayana, the idea, the philosophy, the text all this to Japan. And they developed Mandriana in a, such a fascinating way that it's very interesting to talk about. There are other uh, monks also that we can talk a little bit about them that is very famous among them is Vajrabodhi and Amog Vajra. Amog Vajra was so famous because he worked so successfully with the help of mantras, with the help of rituals that the Chinese emperors could win wars. They could invoke rain, they could stop pandemic, they could cure people, they could revive their trees. So they were performing different kinds of ceremonies. So Chinese were much impressed, so much impressed by them that Amog Vajra was also appointed as Rajguru. And he was respected not only by one emperor, but by three emperors in China. It's amazing the respect that is given to Amog Vajra by the Chinese emperors. Tell us about uh, the centers of learning that were there in India that made major contribution to the literal and cultural advancement of China and gradually East Asia. Uh, there were a number of monasteries in India and uh, monks coming, masters, teachers, they were coming from China and studying there. Uh, for example, people normally talk about Vikram Shila, Odantpuri, Takshashila, uh, Nalanda, etc. So these masters, they, they who were coming to India, they were staying in different places. There were a large number of monasteries, uh, monastic establishments, I should say, uh, with uh, with uh, all this uh, knowledge and uh, huge libraries, and uh, they had uh, prominent teachers to teach them. So Nalanda stands at, at the top because we have enough of information about Nalanda. Because of, about other universities, we don't have that much of information. Some information is there in the Tibetan records. Some information is there in the Indonesian records. So it's very scattered and fragmentary information that we have. But about Nalanda, people have written quite a bit. And uh, when we talk about the contribution of Indian universities to the development of Chinese culture, then uh, we have to work teacher by teacher. Who were the teachers who came from China? What were the texts, major texts that they studied? because they stayed here for years and years. And they were not just staying in one university. They were traveling from one to another to third because they wanted to study under very prominent teachers, the famous teachers. And the teachers were famous for different texts also. So whatever texts they studied here, they copied the, those texts, they carried those texts with them. And after going back to China, they established new sects there. So a number of Chinese Buddhist sects are based on the texts that were taken by the Indians, Acharyas, and the Chinese scholars, Buddhist masters, who came here and carried this philosophy with them. And they propagated it. They were well versed into it. King cities, any capital, any new capital that was built was sanctified with the building of monasteries, stupas, temples, digging out caves, 
there are huge cave complexes in China, mesmerizing, beautiful uh, statues and paintings are there. I just wanted to tell you about the Dunhuan Caves. Can you believe that in just one cave complex called Dunhuan, there is, if you calculate, if you measure the wall surface, it's 25 kilometers of murals. They are full of Buddhist texts being depicted in the form of paintings to enlighten people because it's difficult for people to understand the philosophy. So they adopted their new ways. China sent special mission to copy the murals in India. There was one mission that was headed by Wang Chuanxie. He came here and he copied all the murals in the monasteries. But unfortunately, when he was in India, he passed away. Then the emperor sent another mission to bring back all the copies that were made by him working in Indian cave temples because they were used for different reasons, for meditation, for enlightening people, to have transcendental values. What is the difference before and after the coming of Buddhism in China? All the energies that were used to build tombs that was shifted to build monasteries and temples. If you go to Xi'an, just visit the largest tomb that is discovered with thousands and thousands of soldiers, the, the statues of soldiers. So in place of building huge tombs, they started building huge monasteries. It was something pious for them. So Buddhism changed their mindset. They wanted to be devout Buddhists. There was an empress, Empress Wu. According to the Chinese, it was not allowed that any female could rule the country. She could be empress. It was not allowed. But she came, she was told by some Indian masters that yes, in India, it is possible. There are special rituals, there are special texts. So she sent special masters, she brought them, she, she invited them so that they could translate those texts, translate that specific scripture that could permit her to rule the country and special ceremonies were organized. She did a lot of work for dissemination, for spread of Buddhism, for preserving Buddhism. All these emperors during the Than period, during the Ming period, even, even till the 17th century, Qianlong, you talk about Qianlong, 17th century, I have pictures of his bowls with Sanskrit mantras written on them. The ritual bowls that they were using were embellished with Sanskrit mantras, with the seed syllables. Chinese has collected all the Buddhist texts that were translated into Chinese into a compendium that is called Tripitaka. So Chenlong requested, or he ordered, you can say, to collect all the Sanskrit mantras taken out of the Chinese Tripitaka. Then he asked, he ordered to transcribe them into four different scripts because people who could read Manchu script, Mongol script, Chinese and the Tibetan script. And those huge number of mantras were collected and published. And later on, it was published by our Academy, International Academy of Indian Culture in 22 volumes, thick volumes. And he presented, Chenlung presented it to his mother at her 80th birthday. Why 80th birthday is so important? Because when a person completes 80 years of his life, that means he has seen 1,000 full moon days. It is called in Sanskrit, Sahasri Chandra Darshi. So that was the spirit. How that th there was so much of impact on their mindset, on their thought, on the philosophy of life, on administration. Everything changed with Buddhism. In some uh... Was this the evidence of uh, the philosophy of the land? Vasudev Kutumkam, the world is one family. Of course, Indian masters, whatever they created, whatever they wrote, do we know the names? Do we know who wrote these uh, Upanishads? Knowledge was meant for everybody. Whatever knowledge, whether it was to treat people, Vedias were not charging, teachers were not charging, whatever knowledge we had, it was for everybody. The entire earth, the entire globe, all the people living on this earth 
have been seen as one family. That is why all the Acharyas took these perilous journeys. I would like to give just one example of a Chinese master also. In Japan, Emperor Shomu in the 8th century and the Empress, they wanted to be initiated because these practices of initiation and Diksha and Pran Pratishta, they were so new for them. The Japanese Emperor Shomu and his wife, the Empress, they were waiting for a very prominent Chinese teacher. He was, his name was Ganji. He tried hard to travel by sea to reach Japan. He tried 12 times, but he could not. The 13th time when he reached there, he was blind. He lost his eyesight because the journeys were so, so much full of dangers. They were so difficult. Finally, when he reached there and he was blind, but the emperor received him with, the, with so much warm welcome, imperial welcome was given to him. A special monastery was built, a special platform for initiation ceremony was built for him. So the Chinese also sacrificed their lives. Even the cohorts of Kumarajiva, when Kumarajiva was being taken from Kucha to China, then on his way in Wuwei, his horse died. And because horse was so important, horse is a symbol of imperial power, but horse is also a symbol of Buddhist knowledge. They were used to carry the sacred scriptures. So when the horse of Kumarajiva dies, then the local people collected money and they built a stupa even for the horse. It still stands. I have visited it. The concept of Vasudev Kutumbakam, that all, everybody is a member of one family. It's such a, such a powerful, so powerful concept that if even today, if the world accepts this, there will be love. There will be compassion. There will be sacrifice. Because in a family, we all sacrifice for each other. So Vasudev Kutumbakam, I think, is the best to have peace in the world, to have friendship, to have harmony. There will be no wars. Why we fight if we are one family? Well, on that note, uh, Dr. Bala, we'll uh, conclude uh, our conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and telling us about the kind of role that Indian scholars particularly played in building the cultural foundations of the whole of Asia. Thank you. Power of Listening you heard the fourth episode of our all-new series on traditional Indian knowledge systems. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back on the fourth Friday of this month, that is, the 22nd of October, same time, with another episode taking you on a journey through our glorious traditional Indian knowledge systems. This program was anchored and produced by Munmun Bhattacharya and the expert on the show was Dr. Shashibala Indologist. The series has been conceptualized by Shashi Shekhar Vempati, CEO, Prasar Bharati. This episode is also available on our official YouTube channel, Akashwani AIR. Be there on the 22nd of October, same time, same frequencies. Bye for now.